Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Grace Church. If you're joining us online, we're delighted to have you join us this morning. And I'm looking forward to our time together in worship of our God. I've been thinking about what it is that we do when we come together. We don't come together for a ritual. We don't come together simply out of obedience. We join together each week in order to seek to know God more clearly. We long for His presence to fill our hearts with joy and peace and believing. And so we come together each week in order to go hard together after God. And I want you to kind of look around to the people around you and think about those that will be joining us here in a little while. And just think that what you're also doing is looking at the people next to you and you're saying, join me. Join me in worshiping our great God. You see, when we come together, we're not just coming together for ourselves, but we're coming together to bring along the church body to encourage each other's faith. And so let's do that this morning. And before we start and open our service, I want to pray for our church. And specifically this week, I've been thinking of Ephesians 6.18, where we are called to make supplication for the saints. We're called to bring the saints before God to think of those that we know of that are in need and to pray for them. And I want to take some time just as a church to pray for those in our body who have lost loved ones, who have been going through difficulties of being away from them, and lift them up and ask for the Lord to give them comfort, strength, because that's what we long to do. So I'm not going to mention anybody's name, uh, more than likely because I would cry if I did, (laughs) But I want to encourage you as we're praying together for you to think of people by name that you know and to make supplication before the Lord on their behalf. So let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, we lift up your holy name. God, we know that you are good. We know that you are righteous. We know that you are wise. We know that you are working all things together for the counsel of your purposes and your plans. And God, we know, though, that in the midst of trials and struggles, in the midst of hardships, it's hard to see your goodness. God, I lift up to you those in the body of Christ that have lost loved ones in this past year. Those here in Abu Dhabi who have been unable to visit and from afar have seen their loved ones taken home. God, I pray that you would pour out your comfort upon them. You are the God of all comfort. That you would fill them with peace in believing, the peace that passes all understanding. That you will satisfy them so much with your presence that they glorify you in the midst of the trial. God, I pray that you would strengthen those who have traveled home to be with loved ones and to plan and prepare for the future without them. I pray that you would give them wisdom and strength to walk rightly before you and to use this as an opportunity to display your glory to the world around them. God, I pray for those who are confused about your purposes inside of this. That you would remind them of your goodness. That you would bring to their minds Romans 8.28 that says you are working together all things for the good of those who love you. That they would not doubt, but they would trust in you. God, I pray that in the midst of these trials and these struggles and the temptations they face, that you will show yourself real and alive. That you will pour out your presence upon them. That you will strengthen them by the power of your Holy Spirit. And that you will set their hearts ablaze with the joy of your name. God, I pray that you will make us a people at Grace Church who make supplication on behalf of the saints that are around us. That when we hear of those that are suffering, our hearts immediately are bent to pray for them to bring them before you, to ask for you to comfort them. God, we pray that as we meet together this morning, it would be a reminder of who you are, 
and that we would seek to know you with our whole hearts and that you would open our eyes to see wonderful truths from your word, that you will delight us as we worship your name, and that you will satisfy us with your presence this morning so we will sing all the days of our life. God, we need you. We need you. We need the joy of your presence. And so we ask for you to come and fill us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Why don't you join us in standing? And before we sing worship to our great God, listen to the words of Psalm 99. The Lord reigns. Let the peoples tremble. He sits enthroned above the cherubim. Let the earth quake. The Lord is great in Zion. He is exalted over all the peoples. Let them praise your great and awesome name. Holy is he. The king, is, king in his might loves justice. You have established equity. You have executed justice and righteousness in Jacob. Exalt the Lord our God. Worship at his footstool. Holy is he. Moses and Aaron were among his priests. Samuel also was among those who called upon his name. They called to the Lord and he answered them. In the pillar of the cloud he spoke to them. They kept his testimonies and the statute that he gave them. O Lord, our God, you answered them. You were a forgiving God to them, but an avenger of their wrongdoings. Exalt the Lord our God and worship at his holy mountain, for the Lord our God is holy. Amen. Church, let us all exalt our living God, for he is holy. Amen. commands all the hosts of heaven who else could make every king bow down who else could whisper and darkness trembles only a holy God what are the beauty Splendor outshines the sun. What are the majesty rules with justice? Holy, a holy God. Come and behold him, the one and the only.
could rescue me from my failing. Who else could offer his only son? Who else invites me to call him Father? Only a holy. John 1, 36. John saw Jesus and said, Behold the Lamb of God. And when two of his disciples heard it, they saw Jesus and started to follow him. When we behold our Lord Jesus, when we, when we seek his face, all things of this world goes down. It dries out. It diminishes. And we start to follow God. We magnify God. Today, as we are going to worship and as we are going to behold His face, let us all say this, Lord, I will follow you no matter what. I will worship you. I will adore you. I will glorify you. I will praise you. Today, let us sing this song together.
God, be still and behold him. The Lamb of God that took away the sins of the world. Jesus, the Alpha and the Omega. Oh, behold him. Oh, what joy. Oh, what beauty to be on that day in heaven. When we behold him face to face. When we behold our maker. Our redeemer, our savior. Oh, what joy it will be. Father, come magnify yourself in our meeting this morning. As your saints come to behold you, Father. Magnify yourself in our midst. Show us your beauty, your glory once again. Fold our hearts with the joy of worshiping at your feet. Help us to enjoy the pleasures at your right hand this day. Go with us, O oh God, in the service, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Please be seated. And talking to a brother yesterday just reminded me of how much sometimes we just need to be still and know that he is God. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Ben Smith. I'm one of the elders here at Grace Church, and I get the joy and privilege of opening the Word of God for us this morning before we do, I want to give just a few announcements. First, just in light of the increased cases of COVID, I just want to remind everyone that we want to make sure that if we have experienced any symptoms of illness or any family member has experienced symptoms of illness, that we stay home for the sake of others and not potentially spreading COVID um, to people here. So um, please just monitor your symptoms even if it's just a mild cold, um, out of the sake of love and caution, we want to, to stay at home um, to, to protect others. Uh, secondly, if you are interested, our visual team is in need of volunteers. So this is the team that runs the slides on Saturday mornings and puts together those things during the week um, so that the church here can follow along with the sermon more easily. So if you are interested in learning about how to run the slides, we would encourage you to either speak with Debbie in the back, um, who leads our team, or go to gracechurchabudabi.com backslash volunteer, and you can see how to get plugged in. And the last announcement I want to make is that in two weeks, we're going to be starting another men's Bible study together. It'll be 13 weeks together through the books of First and Second Timothy and Titus. Very excited about this study and looking forward to it. So if you haven't been a part of our men's study before, I would encourage you to go to the website and look for information about how to get the book that we will study through. And I'm looking forward to doing this together with all of you guys. Well, let me pray for us before we open God's word. Our Father in heaven, we make one simple yet profound request. Show us your glory. Show us yourself. God, will you use this word this morning to delight us with your presence, to remind us of who you are, and to give us joy in you, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. But please open your Bibles to Exodus chapter 4. 
Today we're going to be looking at verses 18 through 31, continuing in the story of the Lord's deliverance of Israel from the bondage of Egypt. The story of Exodus is a pivotal story in the Bible, as it shows how God set apart the nation of Israel to be His people and established His covenantal relationship with them. It introduces us to important truths about God, about His character, about His power, about His covenant, and His rule over the earth. And in Exodus chapter 1, what we saw was how Israel had increased greatly in the land of Egypt. So much so that as a new king of Egypt arose that did not know Joseph, he began to fear the people of Israel that they would be too many and too mighty for the Egyptians. We saw how this fear grew to a point where he sought to kill the sons of the Hebrews. The hope of Israel and the promised Messiah was growing dim. But in chapter 2, we were introduced to Moses, a Hebrew boy that was saved from Pharaoh and raised by Pharaoh's daughter. However, when Moses grows up, He sees his people of Israel being mistreated by an Egyptian and he strikes the Egyptian dead. So he then flees for his life and ends up in the land of Midian, settling to dwell there and raise a family. The hope of deliverance grew even more dim. But at the end of chapter 2, we read of the Lord hearing, seeing, and knowing the affliction of his people and remembering the covenant he made with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And then in chapter 3, verse 1 through 4, verse 17, where we ended last week, we were shown how God called Moses to be his instrument to deliver Israel, and what took place between Moses and God at the burning bush on Mount Sinai. We learned that Moses was skeptical of his ability and fearful And so he questioned God's decision. But we saw that God was ever patient with Moses, giving him comfort, powerful signs to show the people of Israel, and providing even his brother Aaron to help with the task. Starting next week in chapter 5 and going all the way through chapter 14, we're going to discover what the Lord did to redeem Israel from Egypt. And what takes place in our passage this morning is a series of events that happen as Moses makes his way back to Egypt before standing before Pharaoh. What I want you to see this morning is that this passage reveals to us how God was going to set apart Israel for the sake of His glory. To be a people who worshipped Him and spread the glory of His name throughout the entire world. So start with me in our first section of our passage. In verses 18 through 20. Where we see the stage set through the assurance of safety. Look at verse 18. Moses went back to Jethro, his father-in-law, and said to him, Please let me go back to my brothers in Egypt to see whether they are still alive. And Jethro said to Moses, Go in peace. So Moses finally relents of his questioning. And he goes to his father-in-law to ask for permission to leave. But did you notice that he doesn't tell Jethro that God met with him or the real reason he is going back? Could it be that he's still hesitant? about the calling. It's that timid step forward that we always have sometimes when God calls us to something that's dangerous. We don't know why Moses asked it in this way, but what we see is that Jethro gives his blessing. And then look at what the Lord says to Moses in verse 19. And the Lord said to Moses in Midian, Go back to Egypt. For all the men who are seeking your life are dead. 
So God meets again with Moses, this time in Midian, to assure him that no man alive that sought to kill him was still alive. Now I want you to keep this in mind so that you will see why I say this is setting the stage of something. Just mark that really quickly because we're going to look back at it in a second. But before we continue on, just pause here and just notice the kindness of God towards Moses. It would seem Moses is still unsure of his calling and his safety in Egypt. And God, in his mercy, meets him again to give him comfort that the men he may be afraid of are no longer alive. God is so gracious towards us, isn't he, church? In spite of our questioning, in spite of our weak hearts, when we need comfort and assurance, the Lord provides. His mercy truly is new every single morning. And so we continue on in verse 20. So Moses took his wife and his sons and had them ride on a donkey and went back to the land of Egypt. And Moses took the staff of God in his hand. He doesn't go alone. He takes his wife and what is now two sons with him. And did you notice how the staff is described? It's the staff of God. It's the staff of God. This reminds us that the Lord's power and presence was promised to be with Moses. The Lord was sending Moses. The Lord comforted Moses with the assurance of safety. And the Lord's power would be Mo with Moses in Egypt. What beautiful truths for us to see. Now move with me to our next section in verses 21 through 23. Where we see the disclosure of God's plans and purposes. Read verse 21. And the Lord said to Moses, When you go back to Egypt, see that you do before Pharaoh all the miracles that I have put in your power, but I will harden his heart so that he will not let the people go. Now this can be a very difficult verse for us to wrestle with because of what it is communicating to us. Notice first that Moses is told to perform the same miracles for Pharaoh as the people of Israel. But the miracles serve a different purpose for Pharaoh. For the people of Israel, they were designed to help them believe. But for Pharaoh, they would be designed to harden his heart so that he won't let Israel go. Now church, this is the first time in Exodus that we are going to run across this concept of the hardening of Pharaoh's heart. But this will be a repeated theme throughout the next 10 chapters. One author gives a helpful summation of the biblical data that we're going to find. He points out that three times Yahweh declares that He will harden Pharaoh's heart. Six times Yahweh actually hardens Pharaoh's heart. Seven times the hardening is expressed as a divine passive with Yahweh as the implied subject. In other words, Pharaoh's heart was hardened by Yahweh. And three times we are told that Pharaoh hardened his own heart. Now because we're going to dig into this more when we get to chapter 7, which is the most expansive section on the concept, I'm only going to make a few observations this morning to help us. And for those who are intrigued and wanting to know more about this concept, I want to encourage you to continue with us in Exodus. The first observation that I want to make is that the first time this concept is used, it's spoken to Moses to prepare him ahead of time with what the Lord is going to do. God says, but I will harden his heart in order that he won't let Israel go. In other words, church, God is saying, know this ahead of time, Moses. 
I don't want Pharaoh to let Israel go after you perform the signs I gave you power to do. So I will harden his heart so that he won't. Secondly, notice what God tells Moses to say to Pharaoh in verses 22 through 23. He says, Then you shall say to Pharaoh, Thus says the Lord, Israel is my firstborn son. And I say to you, let my son go that he may serve me. If you refuse to let him go, behold, I will kill your firstborn son. Now for those of us that know the story of Exodus, what should stand out to us is that this is a reference to the last of the ten plagues. So do you see what the author is letting us in on? God told Moses that he would harden Pharaoh's heart so that he wouldn't let Israel go. And we see that this would be the reason for Pharaoh's refusal to let Israel go throughout all the plagues until the final plague of the death of the firstborn sons of Israel. We don't know if God told Moses ahead of time that there would be ten plagues, but what we do know is that God told Moses that he would kill Pharaoh's firstborn son if he refused to let him go. And here we see that Pharaoh's refusal to do so will be because God will harden his heart. Now church, this is not something that we should try to smooth out to our liking. It's not presented here to get into a philosophical debate on God's sovereignty and man's free will. As one pastor helpfully put it, what this is about in the context of Exodus 4 is about who God is. And no matter how that causes a little tension in the way that we think, we are to receive it by faith and we are to be in awe. And I think he's absolutely right. This is a truth about God that we are called to receive by faith. It's a truth intended to help us to know our God. To see something about Him and to trust in Him. Again, we're going to think very deeply about this in the coming weeks, and especially when we get to chapter 7. But for now, my encouragement is simply to take note of who God is and to stand in awe. Just to stand in awe of who your God is. I go back to verse 22 though, and notice what God says of Israel. Thus says the Lord, Israel is my firstborn son. Oh, church, this is a beautifully sweet term pointing to God's adopting covenantal love. God is doing all of this throughout Exodus to prove that Israel is his firstborn son. In Hosea 11.1, 1, the Lord says this, When Israel was a child, I loved him. And out of Egypt, I called my son. When God calls Israel his firstborn son, he is communicating that they belong to him. They are his, and they are loved by him. And what, what is Israel that they deserve this kind of attention from Yahweh? From the Lord, the maker of the heavens and the earth. Deuteronomy 7, 7 and 8 clarifies. It was not because you, Israel, were more in number than any people that the Lord set his love on you and chose you. But it is because the Lord loves you and is keeping the oath that he swore to your fathers that the Lord has brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of slavery from the hand of the Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. It is simply because the Lord chose to covenant with Abraham and set them apart as a people for himself. And this adopting covenantal love is something that we now have access to through the blood of Jesus Christ. Galatians 3.26 says, For in Christ Jesus you all are sons of God through faith. 
1 John 3, 1. See what kind of love the Father has given to us that we should be called children of God. And so we are. So as you're looking at this section of the passage and you're starting to wrestle with what's going on, stand in awe, church, of the judgment of God towards Pharaoh and of his kindness and his mercy towards Israel and towards you. All of this for the sake of the glory of his name. Now, if that section wasn't tricky enough, we're going to move to verses 24 through 26. And any of you that studied this passage in our home groups knows why this section gets admittedly a little odd. <laughs> but what I think we ultimately see here is a confrontation of high importance. You see, this, these verses are not something to just pass by and not think over. There's a high importance of what is happening in these three verses so read verses 24 through 26 together with me. At a lodging place on the way, the Lord met him and sought to put him to death. Then Zipporah took a flint and cut off her son's foreskin and touched Moses' feet with it and said, Surely you are a bridegroom of blood to me. So he let him alone. It was then that she said, a bridegroom of blood because of the circumcision. Do you remember when I said earlier that the stage was being set in verses 18 through 20? Notice verse 19 again in relation to verse 24. Verse 19, all the men who are seeking your life are dead. Verse 24, the Lord met him and sought to put him to death. I just pause there for a moment and just think about that connection. Now there's some debate among scholars of whether the him in this verse is Moses or his son, but it makes the most sense to see it as Moses because his son hasn't been introduced yet in the passage. And the connection to verse 19 amplifies that for us. What this is telling us is that Moses was safe from the men who sought to kill him, but he was not safe from the God who sought to kill him. And that has to sink in. We have to let that stand for what it says. Because this shows that the greatest questions we need to answer in this passage are not, did Zamora touch Moses' feet or her son's? Or what in the world does bridegroom of blood, blood mean? The greatest questions we need to ask are what would cause the Lord to seek to put Moses to death? And what satisfies the wrath of God? And what does this then reveal to us? And to find those answers, we need to take note of what Zipporah did, how God responded, and what the saying is related to. In verse 25, we see that Deporah, Zipporah took action. She circumcised her son and she touched Moses' feet, the foreskin. There's some uncertainty about who, Moses, who Zipporah touched and where she actually touched him, but I'm persuaded of the translation in front of us that she touched Moses' feet and probably as a symbol of something. And what we then see in verse 26 is that God's wrath was appeased. He relinquished his attack and let Moses live. And the phrase bridegroom of blood was said because of the circumcision. So all of this points to a lack of circumcision as the reason why God sought to put Moses to death. And the act of circumcision as the reason why God's wrath was satisfied. So why in the world was circumcision so important? That the Lord would meet Moses along the way and seek to put him to death. And to understand this, we should look at Genesis 17, where God institutes the covenant with Abraham. In Genesis 17, 10 through 11, we read this. This is my covenant, the Lord says, 
which you shall keep between me and you and your offspring after you. Every male among you shall be circumcised. You shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskins, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and you. Circumcision was the sign of the covenant between God and His chosen people. Now listen to what God says in Genesis 17, 14. Any uncircumcised male who is not circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin shall be cut off from his people. He has broken my commandment. My covenant. So we see that the importance of circumcision is its relationship to the covenant with God. Failing to circumcise a male meant that that male would be cut off from the people of God because of breaking the covenant. So the reason God sought to put Moses to death is because of his disobedience to the covenant that God made with his people. This is not an easy thing to wrestle through, but it's the truth of God's Word. And what we see is that the satisfying of God's wrath towards Moses was due to the fulfillment of those covenantal obligations by Sipporah. So church, this is teaching us the importance of the covenant with God. Circumcision was the mark of of the people of God who were set apart for the sake of His glory. Now listen to what God will tell Moses to say to Israel in Exodus 19, 4-6. You yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on Ingle's wings and brought you to myself. Now therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, You shall be a treasured possession among all peoples, for all the earth is mine. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. You see, at the end of coming out of Egypt, Moses is going to call the people of Israel to obey the voice of the Lord and to keep his covenant. How could he do this if he had not kept it himself? So the Lord in his kindness meets Moses and shows him the necessity of keeping the covenantal obligations. Now what I think this is showing us is that God's covenant is not something to be taken lightly. It is of utmost importance. I'll get to another reason why in just a minute. Let me give a quick comment though on Why I think Zipporah says bridegroom of blood, because I know everyone's curious about it. There's many, many understandings and interpretations out there. The honest truth is we don't know for sure. Uh, I'm persuaded personally that Zipporah said this to Moses out of disgust for the Hebrew act of circumcising children on the eighth day. Because only one son is mentioned here, And because Zipporah will basically disappear until chapter 18 and go back to her family, I think there's good reason to believe that circumcision was not something that she wanted and that Moses had given in to her wishes and not led his family. This to me makes the most sense as to why Moses is the one God is seeking to put to death and how Zipporah would even know that circumcision of her son It needed to happen to appease the Lord's judgment. So in the end, she cries out at Moses in disgust for the bloody ritual, you are a bridegroom of blood to me. My encouragement, though, is to just keep studying it on your own. I don't know that that's the most important thing to figure out. But church, what's more interesting is that this is the first time the idea of blood is used in relation to circumcision. Circumcision has been talked about before in Genesis. This is the first time we see blood associated with it. And many suggest, and I agree with them, that this is a moment then pointing to the blood that will be shed in the Passover and the necessity of the shed blood of Jesus Christ. If you have some time, look up Colossians 2, 11 through 14 on your own. Because you see the shedding of blood 
has always been the requirement for the atonement of sin and the pardon of a holy God. In the Exodus, the Passover will be a symbol pointing to the eventual finished work of Jesus Christ, who shed His own blood for His people, establishing the new covenant. This is why when instituting communion in Matthew 26, 28, Jesus says, this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. So what I think we see here is a mention of what is called propitiation by the blood of a substitute. God's wrath is appeased and turned aside. And in a similar way to how God stood opposed to Moses and did not yield until the covenantal obligations were sealed, the truth is God stands opposed to all who are not covered by the blood of Jesus Christ of the new covenant. Without the blood of the new covenant, we are hopeless. We are hopeless. So if you have not yet, trust and the shed blood of Jesus Christ is the only way to be forgiven of your sins and to be reconciled to God. And church, keep trusting in that until Jesus either returns or takes you home to glory. We have one more section to get through. I promise it's a little lighter. It's in verses 27 through 31. And here we see two things. First is the fulfillment of all that was spoken. Oh, the beauty of these verses. Verses 27 through 31. The Lord said to Aaron, Go into the wilderness to meet Moses. So he went and met him at the mountain of God and kissed him. And Moses told Aaron all the words of the Lord with which he had sent him to speak and all the signs that he had commanded him to do. Then Moses and Aaron went and gathered together all the elders of the people of Israel. Aaron spoke all the words that the Lord had spoken to Moses and did the signs in the sight of the people. And the people believed. The Lord told Moses Aaron would meet him. And it happened. The Lord told Moses, Aaron would speak all the words that he would give to Moses. And Aaron spoke all the words. Signs were given for the people to believe. And they believed. Every word spoken by God was fulfilled. Every word. And in the coming weeks, we'll see this continue to happen over and over again. Every word the Lord speaks to Moses will be fulfilled. Church, our God's plans and purposes are never thwarted. Never. They're never hindered. Nothing stands in His way. Every word that He says comes to pass. And every word that His Son has said to us and every word that the apostles have said to us will come to pass. We are never left to stand and wonder if God will accomplish His purposes. We are never left to wonder if God will fulfill His word. We can take it to the bank. It will always happen. It's as good as done. Such beautiful truth. Secondly, from this section, we see the beginning of Israel fulfilling its purpose. Look back at verse 23. God tells Moses to say this to Pharaoh. Let my son go that he may serve me. You see, the goal of the Lord bringing Israel out of Egypt was so that they would serve him, which is an act of worship. They were set apart to be a people who worshipped the Lord. And in verse 31, what do we see? And the people believed. And when they heard that the Lord had visited the people of Israel and that He had seen their affliction, they bowed their heads and worshipped. This exact phrase will be repeated in Exodus 12 after they are given instructions in the Passover. They will bow their heads in worship. They're beginning to fulfill the purpose for which they were set apart. Sadly, 
many of the people here that believed. We will find out, if we keep reading the Bible, would not continue in belief. And they would not enter the promised land. But here, they're showing the fulfillment of the purpose for which God's people are set apart. It's for the sake of his glory, to worship his holy name. And this all serves as a reminder to us who are now under the new covenant. Israel was set apart for the sake of God's glory, to be a people who worshiped him and spread the glory of his name to the nations around him. And we are the same. Ephesians 1 tells us that our adoption as sons, our inheritance in Christ, and our sealing with the Holy Spirit is all to be to the praise of His glory. 1 Corinthians 10.31 tells us to do all for the glory of God. 1 Peter 4.11 reminds us that we serve in the strength God supplies in order that in everything God may be glorified. He receives the glory and we the joy. And this is really the central book of this book of Exodus, a people who are saved for the glory of God. And it should be the supreme desire of our hearts to see God's name magnified and glorified throughout the earth. There's a book that I love to read about missions that says missions exist because worship doesn't. That's what we're after, the worship of our God. So as you look at this passage and you see what God has done to set apart a people for the glory of his name, think even deeper about what he has done for you. He has redeemed you through the precious blood of Jesus Christ. He has set you apart for his name's sake to be a people who bring him glory. Cling to the blood of Jesus for the forgiveness of sins and the sealing of the new covenant. Remember the signs and the wonders that he has done to help us believe and stand in awe of our God with a desire to bring glory to his name. Will you join me in standing as I pray this over us? Our Father in heaven, Make your name great on our hearts and our minds. God, we don't want to long. We don't want to shy away from difficult passages, but we want to press in to know you more. So I ask that through the power of your word, you would speak to the hearts of your people, showing us who you are. You would remind us of your goodness, of your holiness, of your majesty, and we would worship and adore and honor you all the days of our lives. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Such an awesome God we serve. Such a wonderful God. Let's praise Him.
prayer of my heart this week is that in it all we would say such an awesome God let me end with a benediction from 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 verses 23 and 24 now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ He who is faithful, he who calls you is faithful. He will surely do it. Amen. Have a great week in the Lord.